So hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, for me uh, to be able to introduce uh, uh, Steve Hills, um, that we that is the speaker for today. He's the head of the astronomy group at the School of Physics and Astronomy in Cardiff, which is in uh, Wales, in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> Steve uh, did his PhD in Cambridge in the radio astronomy group. Uh, then he uh, made a couple of postdoc at IFA in Hawaii and at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And that's in Hawaii where he became interested in submillimeter astronomy and uh, in uh, astrophysics of uh, dust. Then he got a fixed term position in Toronto and then he uh, went on, on a faculty position in uh, Cardiff. Uh, Steve uh, um, received, uh, was awarded the, the um, uh, the Herschel Medal from the Royal Astronomical Society for his many contribution uh, in the field. Uh, he has more than 300 papers and with uh, more than 20,000 citations, if I uh, checked it correctly, and uh, an impressive age index of uh, 80, 81, if, that's, if I checked correctly as well. Uh, he also writes in books, he has, uh, I think, two books, uh, uh, on the origin of the universe and on uh, planets, and he's currently writing another on uh, on, uh, on the results from the Herschel satellites. If I'm correct, Steve, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll let you start. Thanks. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me because it's always a pleasure uh, to give seminars, and it's, it's it's great to be able to give a seminar in. Um, in Mexico without actually having to travel across the, across the oceans. Uh, so let me just share again. Uh, ooh, um, so what I'm going to do today is, is talk about interstellar dust. Um, and in particular, I'm going to suggest that the properties of interstellar dust are a new way of investigating galaxy evolution. So the work I'm going to talk about is, has been done by lots of different people. Um, so some of the particular uh, people um, who've done work are listed here, but there's also large collaborations. So for example, the Helga collaboration that actually Jacopo was um, a member of. So um, there's people all around the world that have contributed to this. Um, okay, so let, let's just, let me just, probably a lot of you know an awful lot about interstellar dust, but let me just um, remind you of, of kind of how it, some basic things and, and how it was uh, discovered in the first place. Um, the, the person that realized, he didn't realize there was interstellar dust, but he found the thing that shows there is interstellar dust was the, the gentleman um, here, who is uh, William Herschel. Uh, William Herschel um, was the first person to really do systematic surveys of the sky. And he noticed that in some places in the sky, there appeared to be holes where there were no stars. And he called these places holes in the heavens. And you can see, on the picture of Milky Way, there are these large dark areas where there don't appear to be stars. Um, now, we now know that the, the holes in the heavens are not places where there are genuinely no stars, but they're places where there's lots of interstellar dust, um, tiny solid fragments in interstellar space, which act rather like smoke, smoke obscuring the optical light from the stars beyond. Uh, so when you look at uh, the universe in the optical waveband, you see these large dark areas, um, but a way to the energy that's absorbed by the dust grains from the optical light is not lost from the universe. And the dust grains are actually heated slightly. And these then emit at long wavelengths um, in the far infrared and submillimeter wave bands. And a nice example is shown here, where on the right hand side, you can see the, the Horsehead Nebula, which is a famous and iconic astronomical picture, large dark areas. Um, but then on the left hand side, you see a submillimeter image uh, made actually with the James Clark Maxwell telescope. And you can see it's very different because what you're now seeing is you're seeing radiation from the dust grains. The temperature of the dust is about 20 to 30 Kelvin usually. And in this case, um, the submillimeter image shows there are dense areas within the horsehead where there, also, where there are undoubtedly young stars forming, which are warming the dust. Um, so now why should you care about interstellar dust? Um, in, in Britain, uh, there's a, often people say when you're very boring or you're interested about a boring subject, you're a train spotter because 
train spotters are people that go and look at trains and then write down in their notebooks interesting facts about trains. Um, and I tend to think that astronomers often think about people interested in interstellar dust as kind of ast astronomical train spotters. It's one of those things that's not that interesting. But let me point out some really important things about interstellar dust. So for a start, molecules of hydrogen would not exist if there was no interstellar dust, because molecules of hydrogen form by two hydrogen atoms attaching themselves to a dust grain and then splicing themselves together. Um, without the dust, the chance of two hydrogen atoms meeting each other is very, very small. And then, and then, then of course, stars form out of molecular hydrogen, so no stars would be there if there was no interstellar dust. And therefore no planets and therefore no us. Um, a more technical thing is that if you're interested in kind of chemical evolution of galaxies, um, half the metals in the interstellar medium are bound up in dust grains. So again, you have to think of the dust is very, very important. Um, and finally, it turns out that um, a lot of people have argued that a, a good way to actually measure the mass of the interstellar medium in galaxies is by actually looking at the dust or by measuring the dust. Now, this is an important thing to be able to do because if you're interested in galaxy evolution, you need to know how much stuff is in a galaxy that can then turn into stars. And the traditional way that it's been measured, or the molecular phase of the ISM has been measured, is by looking at carbon monoxide. Um, but it turns out there's an awful lot of advantage, advantages to using dust grains rather than CO molecules to measure the ISM. You might think that because carbon monoxide is gas, it's therefore better as a way of tracing the molecular phase than dust grains. But the, the key point is that it's, the CO molecule is only a, a tracer of the gas. There's only one CO molecule to every 10,000 um, hydrogen molecules. Um, and dust grains are traces as well, so CO is not particularly special. And, and the real problem with the CO is that the CO molecule is quite fragile and can easily be split into a carbon and oxygen atom by a slightly energetic photon. And there's, there's results from um, both Herschel, Planck Observatory and the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory that suggest about one third of the molecular gas in our galaxy doesn't contain any CO. So dust grains have an advantage over CO molecules because they're kind of robust. They don't get casually broken apart by photons of starlight. Now, um, one problem, of course, with, with um, dust is that the uh, dust to gas ratio will depend on the metallicity of the gas. But that's also true of CO. This is carbon and oxygen is just metals. Um, and it turns out that the relationship between the dust to gas ratio and metallicity is much, sim is much simpler and, and probably better understood than the, ratio, than the ratio of CO to H2. Um, another advantage of dust is it's always optically thin, or almost always optically thin. And um, a fourth huge advantage is that a lot of the data already exists because Herschel um, made measurements of the dust emission from roughly a million galaxies, and continuum emission from dust is easy to measure with ALMA. Um, and so lots of, the, lots of measurements already exist. Um, and the calculation is quite simple. And I've shown an equation down here that sort of shows how you do it. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have the, the mass of gas. Um, L is just the submillimeter luminosity at some frequency. B is the Planck function that depends on the dust temperature, but you can usually estimate the dust temperature, as I'll show in a moment, by fitting a spectral energy distribution to the uh, flux measurements. Um, and the only two unknowns here, really, are there's a, the term eta, which is basically telling you the ratio of the submillimeter luminosity to the uh, mass of gas. And that's going to depend on two things. It depends on the dust to gas ratio, and it also depends on how efficient the dust grains are at emitting submillimeter radiation. Um, and that is summed up in a thing called the uh, submillimeter dust opacity mass coefficient. So eta is a kind of unknown. It's a constant of proportionality. Um, and there's one other thing that's unknown, although in this equation I've actually um, assumed uh, that I know it. So this factor 1.8 is actually um, a thing called beta, which I'm going to introduce a bit later. And in this equation, I've assumed beta is 1.8. I'll, I'll get into that a bit later. But basically, there's a, the, the big thing you need to know is eta, which is this big constant of proportionality. Um, now, uh, a, a lot of people have actually tried to use this method to then investigate uh, how the, the mass of the ISM depends on redshift. And this shows a, um, 
a, a kind of synopsis of some recent results. So each of these little panels um, is for a different range of um, stellar mass. And on the, uh, the x-axis, uh, we've got redshift. And along here, we've got the, the mass of the interstellar medium divided by the, the mass of the interstellar medium plus the, plus the mass of stars. So if you, have a, if you see a number, of, if you see the 0.5, that implies that half the kind of total baryonic mass of the galaxy is in gas. And um, but, but the different points or the, uh, the code here is that um, the, uh, the purple band shows some measurements made by Nick Scoville in a series of papers um, using ALMA continuum measurements. The orange band shows uh, some measurements made by Linda Ticconi. And then the, the points are ones that uh, my student uh, Jenny Millard made by essentially doing a stacking analysis, which I'll talk about later, um, on a JCMT submillimeter image, basically taking lots and lots of galaxies and working out the average submillimeter flux. And anyway, the, the key point is that you see that the uh, ratio of gas mass to the um, total mass increases with redshift in each, in each bin and often goes over 0.5. So basically at high redshift, galaxies contain more gas mass, more mass in, there's more mass in gas than there is in stars. But a crucial point to um, realize is that this whole method relies on the properties of the dust and on the dust to gas ratio not changing with redshift, which is a, um, a big uncertainty. And as I'm going to show you in a moment, there's actually some evidence it does change. Um, so now I'm going to change tack and I'm going to talk about um, uh, the nearest big spiral galaxy, Andromeda. Uh, and this is some work that we did um, back in the Herschel era, uh, back in 2011-2012. Um, um, Andromeda is an important galaxy because it's, a, it's the nearest big spiral galaxy to our own. So it's the only other big spiral galaxy in the local group. And it's important, the, the, the kind of closeness is important because it's only in galaxies in the local group where you can actually detect individual stars relatively easily. So, um, and then of course, because it's in the local group, it's very close. And so you, if you look at it with any telescope, you get superb resolution. So as the kind of companion galaxy to the Milky Way, it's important to study uh, because it allows us to look at a big spiral galaxy from the outside rather than in the case of the Milky Way, we're looking from the inside. Um, and the, the other thing that's kind of important is that if it was just exactly like the Milky Way, it might, might be a little, little bit boring, but it's different than the Milky Way in interesting ways. So it has a, it has a bigger bulge for a start, which is interesting. And also, um, as you'll see in a moment, um, most of the stars that are in, forming in Andromeda are forming in a big ring rather than distributed over the disk. And so there are these various interesting differences. So it's, it's interesting as something that's similar to the Milky Way, but also different. Um, anyway, um, when Herschel went up, um, we decided, or well, I actually, I think, I believe you had Martin Bass give you a talk um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I, I met Martin in a bar in Madrid and we suddenly realized that um, Andro no one had looked at Andromeda with um, Herschel. And so we decided we'd actually do this. So that all these observations started over a pint of beer in a bar in Madrid. Um, so we did the observations. And what I'm going to do first is show you a, a short, small video showing our observations with Herschel and showing how that um, compares to observing Andromeda in other wave bands. So it was a little video made by the um, European Space Agency. So this is Andromeda observed with four different telescopes. So what you're seeing first is our galaxy. And the, the circle shows Andromeda. And we're now looking in the microwaves with Planck. Uh, the video now focuses on Andromeda, but Planck 
has very poor resolution, so you don't see much information. Now this is the optical picture, and you see the big red stellar bulge in the center and the blue star forming disk around. And as you're going to fade into our Herschel image. So you fade into the Herschel image, the old stellar bulge vanishes, and you see this big ring of dust. And what we're picking up here is the star forming ring, the dust in the star forming ring, and the dust is heated by the, the young stars. Very few young stars in the center. And now we're fading into the X ray picture and we're showing the endpoints of stellar evolution. So you're seeing things like cataclysmic variables, black holes, and you're, you're right, it's all in the center because that's where all the old stars are. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty, um, some pretty images, and it just shows you get a very different perspectives on the universe by observing in the submillimeter and the optical. Um, but now I'm going to show you what we actually did with the data. Um, and most of the work was done by Matt Smith. And what we did is it, there were about 4,000 independent pixels in Andromeda. And in each of the pixels, Matt fitted a fairly sim very simple function to the um, this, this function here to the data. So basically, we had in each pixel, we had measurement, flux measurements at five different wavelengths. And Matt fitted a simple thing called a modified black body function to the data. So the modified black body function is essentially the Planck function, which just depends on dust temperature, times the frequency raised to the power beta. And beta is a thing called the emissivity index, and it's something I'm going to talk about a lot. And the Essentially, what you have, um, each of these pictures shows, a diff these are four represented pixels. And the, essentially, where the peak is in terms of wavelength tends to be the thing you need to know to get the temperature. And the slope at the long wavelength is the thing that you need to get beta. So essentially, Matt contained values of beta and temperature in each of these 4,000 independent pixels. And I'm now going to show you what he found. So what this shows is, um, images of the temperature at the top, beta in the middle, and the gas to dust ratio at the bottom. And the, the temperature image was something we, that was not, we were kind of expecting. It wasn't, a, wasn't unexpected, let's say. And what we found is we found the dust temperature is, is higher in the center, which we kind of explained because that's in the stellar bulge, and we figured the um, radiation, interstellar radiation field might be rather higher there. And there's also some uh, peaks in the star forming ring. And again, that sort of made sense because lots of hot young stars, newly formed, might heat the dust. dust. The thing that we found uh, quite interesting was that if you look at the, the image of beta, we found that beta is higher, the dust emissivity index is higher in the central parts of the galaxy. And we didn't really expect this at all. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, you can see beta against radius, and you see beta rising and it actually rises to well over two which is not expected for most models of interstellar dust it kind of reaches a peak and then it falls right in the center again um, now this was all quite of interesting and we spent a lot of time trying to see whether this was actually right and finally concluded it was um, and since we discovered this um, which matt wrote up in a paper in 2012 this behavior has been seen um, in many other galaxies so this just shows a few examples. Um, at the top is M31 again, although um, we, we actually repeated the analysis, as I'll tell you later, using a slightly more sophisticated method. But again, you see beta is higher in the center. On the left-hand side is M33, which is a less, another, another object in the local group, the spiral galaxy, but slightly less luminous. Then there's NGC628. And on the right-hand side, if you look at the these figures, these are measurements uh, by uh, the uh, Kingfish Consortium of how beta changes with radius for lots of different galaxies. And what they, th they found is they found strong radial variations, but not always in the same way. It wasn't always the case that beta was higher in the middle. Uh, uh, they found galaxies where beta seemed to increase towards the edge as well. So um, there's now a lot of evidence for radial variations in beta within galaxies. Um, and it's even been seen in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, um, by analyzing Planck data. So this is very kind of interesting 
result that beta, a beta I should say, it's the emissivity of dust, but it must depend on the properties of dust in some way. It must depend on the chemical properties, uh, the chemical composition, or possibly the structures of the dust grains. We're finding variations, essentially variations in dust properties change as you go out through galaxies. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting is there also appears to be um, differences in the global properties of the dust between galaxies. So this just shows some results from um, a large survey on the James Clark Maxwell telescope, a thing called Jingle. Um, and this is a paper by Lamperti et al. last year. And what they did is they measured beta globally for each galaxy, and they found that beta seemed to vary between galaxies, um, and it seemed to depend on properties of galaxy. So, for example, um, beta seems to depend, um, in this case, you can see that beta seems to increase with metallicity. Over here, it seems to decrease with the ratio of mass of hydrogen over um, mass of the stars. Uh, so what does all this all mean? Um, well, firstly, it throws doubt on the idea that you can necessarily use dust to probe the interstellar medium um, and um, investigate galaxy evolution. Because if beta is changing between galaxies, this suggests that maybe the global properties of dust are not constant. And so dust may be a doubtful way of investigating the evolution of galaxies. But looking at it more positively, um, the fact that we find beta varying between galaxies and radially within galaxies at least suggests that maybe this is another way of investigating galaxies. Um, because we've got only a limited number of ways we can investigate galaxies. So one popular way, for example, is to measure the metallicity in the gas phase. And both you find gradients in metallicity and you find differences in metallicity between galaxies. And there's whole um, fields, there's a whole field really devoted to trying to understand this, to trying to learn about galaxies and galaxy evolution from metallicity. And it may be that these variations in dust are opening up the possibility of doing the same thing with dust. However, there's one fundamental problem. We have no idea why we're seeing these big variations. This is actually a huge mystery. We think it's probably because either the structures of the dust grains or the chemistry of the dust grains are changing, but none of the standard dust models, neither the, the Themis models um, produced by Ant Jones in Paris or the models of Bruce Drain, give us any real idea of why this is actually happening. So at the moment, it's all extremely uncertain. So the theorists are not really being any help. Um, so what we've been trying to do in the last few years is see if we can get any extra information about why beta might be changing. And so one of the things we've done is we've reanalyzed all the old Herschel data um, using a new technique. So the, the plots here are, are showing again, um, some, these plots are again from Matt's paper in 2012. Um, and what Matt did is he fitted a black modified black body function to the flux measurements for each pixel. Um, but he had to do a couple of quite annoying things. Um, one thing to do this, you have to make an assumption about the temperature of the dust in the galaxy. So a standard thing you might do is assume that all the dust is at one temperature. Or if you're being very, very sophisticated, you might say, well, maybe there's dust at two temperatures. But you have to make some fundamental assumption like that. Um, and another thing that's frustrating is that you've got data at lots of different wavelengths. But to do this, um, you have to convolve all the images to the resolution of the um, most low resolution image. So in the case of Herschel, it's the 500 micron data, which means you throw away a lot of information. Um, but there's now a, um, a new technique called PPMAP, which is, uh, was invented by um, Ken Marsh, who was a postdoc in um, Cardiff, but has now moved back to the States. And it's a, it's a very complicated, but quite rather cool technique. It's a Bayesian technique that firstly, it requires no assumptions about the dust temperature. You simply assume that there, there may be dust at a whole range of temperatures, and it doesn't require the images to be convolved, which means you gain in resolution in your final dust maps. Um, so we did that to the Andromeda data, um, and you can see it at the top, the, um, in the middle is the image of beta again. Um, it's, the same as, it's the same data that was in Matt's paper, uh, but you can now see there's more resolution, there's a lot more detail. Uh, but again, you see the same thing, that beta is, is greater in the center. 
Um, now, the, the, the nice thing about Andromeda is if you look at the top image here, you can see this big um, outline. And this just show, shows the outline of the area that was observed um, in a huge um, Hubble legacy survey called the uh, Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury, I think. And essentially what they did is they just took very deep images of several wave bands with Hubble, and they, they measured the, um, they did photometry for about 100 million stars. Um, and you can use the photometry of the stars to estimate the, the dust extinction in, um, I think, like 25 parsec by 25 parsec bins. And um, what um, Ant Whitworth did with the, our um, some millimeter data and then the Hubble data is he looked at the ratio between the submillimeter and the optical optical depths, uh, which he gave the uh, term R. And then he, 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 see, he saw how this compared with beta. So you can see there's a, um, a plot of R versus beta and there's an inverse correlation, uh, which no one has seen before. And none of the dust models, none of the theorist dust models predict this at all. So we have no idea where this is, why this is, but it's telling us something, again, observationally about the properties of the dust. Um, and then the other thing that's shown in this figure is all the little points, the um, red, the colored points, show the predictions for R and beta for different dust models. And you can see they, most of them bear no relation to the actual data. So we're again in a situation where we're learning more about the properties of the dust, but the theorists are not caught up yet. and They can't explain or give us a really good understanding of what's actually going on. Um, now, the other thing that we've done is actually tried to see whether uh, beta might be um, greater in dense environments because we kind of thought that if you in a in a giant molecular cloud the dust grains might clump together or the dust grains might acquire a an icy mantle and so we thought if we looked in dense if we if we measured beta in dense regions or gm basic basically gas clouds and outside gas clouds we might find a difference um, and this shows some work by another Carter student uh, Gainathri Eknath and what she's done is she's looked at the values of beta in four areas, uh, two regions essentially in the inner part of Andromeda at the same radius. Uh, those are shown at the top. Um, on the left, you see uh, beta measured in pixels, which are, known, which are in places outside molecular clouds. And on the right-hand side, you see beta um, in pixels that are in molecular clouds. And at the bottom, uh, again, you see on the left is molecular clouds, no, on, on the left is not molecular clouds, on the right is molecular clouds, but this time it's further out in the galaxy. So what you see is you see the, the histograms at the bottom are shifted significantly from the histograms at the top, showing what we already knew, that as you go out radially, beta is changing. But when you look at the pixels at the same radius, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether they're in clouds or not. Beta is pretty much the same. So we found no evidence that... Um, beta is different in giant molecular clouds. It doesn't seem to be a density effect. It seems to be a radial effect in galaxies, but nothing to do with density. So from this part of the uh, talk, just a few take home points. Um, the emission from the dust has been suggested as a way of estimating the mass of the interstellar medium. In fact, I wrote a paper about this myself in 2012. Um, and this method does uh, require the properties of the dust to be constant between galaxies. But almost at the same time as I was writing my paper about this, uh, we were discovering, that, discovering in Andromeda that the dust emissivity index beta varies um, within galaxies, and we now know it seems to vary between galaxies, implying that the properties of the dust do not seem to be uniform. They seem to vary within galaxies and vary between galaxies, suggesting there are changes in the chemistry and the structure. And then, unfortunately, and most frustratingly, we don't have any idea at the moment why this is. We don't know what what property of the dust is actually changing that is causing these changes in beta. Okay, um, so now I just want to go on and tell you a little bit about a, a project um, that we've very recently done and it's going to be, should be a paper on the archive in the next week or so. And what we decided to do is we decided to give up on using the dust or the dust emission to trace the mass of the interstellar medium because that seemed to require too much, many assumptions about what's constant. So it requires the assumption that the gas to dust ratio doesn't evolve. And it also requires the assumption that the, the properties of the dust, that the 
the dust mass opacity coefficient um, doesn't change. So what we decide to do is we decide to forget about the gas and just simply concentrate on the dust. Now we still had to make an assumption that the properties of the dust don't actually evolve, that the dust mass opacity coefficient is not changing, but we didn't have to, don't have to assume any longer that the gas to dust ratio is constant. And what we did in a collaboration with uh, Benedict uh, Diemer, who was at the Center for Astrophysics in, um, at Harvard, is we decided to try and um, compare observations with theory. Um, so uh, my student, Jenny Millard, um, you kind of seen the data already, but showed in a different way. What she did is she divided the, the 60,000 galaxies in the cosmos field into uh, bins of stellar mass and redshift. And then she went to the JCMT deep um, sub millimeter survey of the cosmos field and measured the average 850 micron flux in each of the bins. So she goes to the position of each galaxy, measuring the flux, which would have a huge error bar on it uh, because most galaxies are not significantly detected. But then if you've, if you've got several thousand galaxies in a bin, um, even if the, each individual galaxy is not significantly detected, the mean flux is often quite significant. And then um, from the average flux in each bin, she then calculated the, the mean value for the uh, ratio of dust mass to stellar mass. So those were the observations. And then what we then did with the, in terms of theory, is we went to the illustrious TNG um, survey, which is, uh, it's not survey, um, simulation, which is you know, one of the uh, most recent state-of-the-art galaxy simulations. And um, from the simulation, you can generate a galaxy catalog and the galaxy catalog is, you can basically get a galaxy catalog at each redshift. And then we, we did post-processing of the catalog because the catalog for each galaxy, the, the simulation tells you the mass of the, the metals, the heavy elements in the core phase of the ISM. And we simply assume that half the metals are incorporated in dust grains. And there's a lot of observational evidence, uh, both in the nearby universe and in the high redshift universe, that that seems to be about true. Uh, so let me show you what we then got. So um, these, this showed the, the comparison of the observations and data. So uh, each um, panel again is for a different range of stellar mass. And you, what you see is you see the dust mass over stellar mass plotted against redshift and the, the points are our scuba two measurements. There are measurements that Jenny, Jenny Millard made from the scuba two survey. And the orange line is the prediction if, for, from illustrious TNG, if half the metals are always incorporated in dust grains. And then the purple line is also a slightly more sophisticated model in which we try to say, well, okay, if the fraction of metals in dust grains changes, we, we try to think of a plausible way it might, might change. Um, and then made the prediction based on that plausible assumption. But the, the bottom line is you can see in all cases, uh, especially in the, the high mass, high stellar mass bins, um, the illustrious TNG completely under predicts how much evolution there should be and how much dust there should be at high redshifts. Um, now, we're not quite sure of the reason. Um, well, we think basically the problem is that illustrious TNG, um, well, one of the big problems is that it under predicts how much coal gas there is in the high redshift universe because it puts too much feedback in, so it throws out most of the gas. But anyway, the, bo the bottom line is it doesn't do a good job at, at predicting the observations. Um, and then we also did one, uh, we did it one other way. Um, so one of the things we've been doing over the last 10 years, um, is we've been trying to um, estimate the dust mass function and how this depends on, on um, redshift. So the dust mass function is like the luminosity function, but whereas the luminosity function is the, the number, the space density of galaxies as a function of luminosity, the dust mass function is the space density of galaxies as a function of um, dust mass. And in this picture, the, the colored bands show estimates of the dust mass function uh, from Herschel observations um, in fact, made by Loretta Dunn in a paper in 2011. And th this is the dust mass function in five separate redshift bins. So each redshift bin has a, has a width of 0.1 in redshift 
and is at a slightly higher redshift. So the lowest one is a redshift 0 to 0 0.1, then you have 0.1 to 0 0.2. And what Lametta found in her paper is that the significant evolution in the dust mass function, even going out to a redshift of, even by a redshift of 0 0.1, you're seeing significant evolution. So um, I've lost my cursor here, but um, there's essentially the dust mass function um, increases every time you got 0.1 in redshift, you see an increase in the dust mass function. But the, the dashed lines are the predictions for the same redshift slices made by our method based on us just TNG. And again, you see very little evolution at all. So whereas the observations are suggesting strong evolution in dust, the at least illustrious TNG, one of the most state-of-the-art simulations is predicting very little evolution. Anyway, um, I now want to show you some very recent work. Uh, so um, I, I'm not going to really show you any great scientific results, but I just want to tell you about a project that we're doing. Um, now, Herschel produced these amazing submillimeter images of, of Andromeda, but Herschel was a relatively small telescope, three and a half meter uh, mirror. So the resolution was good, but it was, in principle, you could do much better if you um, observed Andromeda from the ground. Um, but in 30 years of submillimeter astronomy, Andromeda has never been mapped properly from the ground before. And the reason for that is, um, if you can see on the right hand side, this is a, um, it was a pilot observation we made of part of Andromeda with the SCUBA-2 camera on the James Clark Maxwell telescope. And um, what you can see here is that um, you see emission from the, from the uh, galaxy, that's fine, but you see all these nasty dark areas on either side of the emission. And the reason for this is that Andromeda is so big on the sky, um, almost a degree across, and the SCUBA-2 camera, I think, is uh, 10 arc minutes by 10 arc minutes. So any structure uh, that is bigger than the scale of the size of the camera tends to get uh, wiped out by huge problem fluctuations in the Earth's atmosphere. And to get rid of these fluctuations, you have to do a filtering, which essentially removes all the large scale structure. So when you observe Andromeda, essentially see the small scale structure with a with using a camera on the ground, um, but you can't see the large scale structure. So we got this pilot data, um, and then um, Matt Smith, um, a postdoc in Cardiff, uh, realized there was a clever way to overcome this fundamental limitation of um, some millimeter astronomy from the ground. He basically said, well, let's, what we'll do is we'll operate in the Fourier domain and we'll use the camera on the ground to give us the high K Fourier components, so the, all the small scale structure, and we'll, we'll, we'll um, give a telescope like, use a telescope like Planck, which is in space and is very stable, to give us a large scale structure. And we realized that with this, by, combine, by combining ground based and space based data, in this way, we will be able to produce the first high fidelity images of galaxies in the local group. Um, and uh, we've now got a, um, a large program on the James Clark Maxwell telescope called Hashtag, um, which is going to take 280 hours. And the aim is to provide the first high fidelity images of Andromeda at 450 microns and 850 microns. Um, it will have, five time, will have five times better resolution than our original Herschel data. And this um, project has a, a lot of um, science goals, um, but three of the, the key ones are that we want to follow up the, well, the first one is we want to follow up the variation in the properties of interstellar dust. So what we plan to do is by combining the Hubble results, which also probe the dust by looking at the dust extinction, by probing, by combining the JCMT results for the Hubble results, we aim to measure um, three different properties of dust grains at 40,000 separate positions in Andromeda's disk. And you want to sum this up in, in just one very sort of um, nice phrase. I think this will essentially give us the first atlas of interstellar dust in a galaxy. So we'll have this huge atlas of dust, see the, see the variation in the properties of the dust, and then this will hopefully give us a clue, give us clues about what's causing the variations in the dust. Uh, so that's one thing. 
Um, another thing that we're doing that's actually turning out to be quite interesting is um, everyone always assumes, I think, I probably assume myself, that um, all giant molecular clouds are pretty much the same. You have a big cloud of molecular gas, molecular gas starts turning into stars, um, and then eventually all the gas is, is, is uh, destroyed. Um, but what, what we plan to do with the, um, the new data is we plan to examine the, all the molecular clouds, both measure the mass of dust in each cloud, and also measure the star formation rate in, in each cloud. And this will allow us then to see if there's, look at the diversity of clouds. Is there a difference between, in say the gas to dust ratio between clouds? And in fact, we've got some preliminary data, um, that, that not from the, the JCMT data, but actually from our original inertial data, that there do appear to be big differences in gas to dust ratio. Also, um, is the history of star formation in a cloud always the same? And then we go to the third point. Uh, by, by looking at the star formation and the gas and the dust in, in clouds all over this galaxy, we hope to be able to see whether the, whether the history of star formation in a particular cloud kind of depends on the environment of the cloud. Are the clouds that just don't collapse to, into stars? Are the kind of clouds without any stars forming? Is there something that in the environment that triggers the collapse of gas into a cloud. So basically, are all clouds the same, or might their properties depend on the kind of local environment within the galaxy? So we've got no results from this. Um, we've got no science results from this um, survey so far. Um, but Matt sent me today um, the latest 850 micron image that we've got. So 60% of the data is in. And the image on the right shows our 850 micron image. So again, not all the data, but 60% um, of the data. And then if you look in close up at the little area, the little box, um, uh, what you can see in the middle is you can see the result of combining a scuba 2 450 micron image, which has got much better resolution than 850, with um, a Spire image, so Spire was one of the cameras on Herschel, and Spire made an image at 500 microns. So whereas in the 850 micron image, we use Planck data to put the large scale components back, at 450 microns, we use the Herschel 500 micron data to do the same thing. So by combining space data and ground-based data, we can really produce these high fidelity images of the biggest nearby spiral galaxy. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of going to finish um, with um, some slides I just wrote about an hour ago, um, because um, it's great to be talking to a, um, a Mexican audience, because of course you, uh, you guys have the largest millimetre telescope in the world. Um, and we have some connections in Cardiff um, with um, the LMT. Uh, we have two kind of technical connections, um, and I should say I'm not a technician, so I don't, a technical person, I don't build the things. Um, but in Cardiff, um, our instrumental people are building, part of a team that's building the Mexico-UK submillimeter camera for astronomy, MUSCAT, which is a um, camera that's based on Kinter detectors um, that will operate at uh, 1.1 millimeter. Um, and the uh, same team of people in the instrumentation group in Cardiff are also part of building, or they're part of the a team that's building the Toltec camera, which is the big um, camera, which is, uh, I think, mostly built by US uh, scientists, which will be um, a, a, a more sophisticated camera for the LMT, um, this time operating at three wave wavelengths. Um, and then another thing that we have in the UK is we have the access to the James Clark Maxwell telescope. And we've, we've just negotiated continued access to this telescope until 2024. Um, and during this time, we will go from a um, the SCUBA 2 camera, which operates at 850 microns and 450 microns. Um, and we hope to have a, a new kids based camera available during that time um, that will have 10 times the mapping speed of SCUBA 2. Um, and I think, I think, guess the point I'd like to make, I suppose, is that uh, the, the cameras on LMT are going to be terribly powerful for operating mostly at millimeter wavelengths. Um, but especially with SCUBA 3 on the JCMT, we will have a camera that's um, possible to do large-scale surveys 
uh, at 850 microns. And, and there's lots of interesting collaborative projects that are possible. Uh, and I, I haven't really, didn't really give much thinking thought to this, but I just thought I'd just mention uh, a couple. Um, now, one of these is already happening with the, um, the, the Muscat team in Mexico. Um, as part of Herschel, we carried out a thing called the Herschel Atlas, which was the largest area survey of the sky with Herschel, and it detected uh, 400,000 sources, 440,000 sources. Um, and you can see the picture on the left is just one tiny part of our, to our, our total survey. I think the 6,000 submillimeter sources in this image. Um, you can also see the moon, but I have to say we didn't actually detect the moon. We just put it there to show you how big even this small part of the survey was. Um, now, each of these sources was observed at three, uh, well, five different wavelengths, and it's possible to estimate redshifts for all of the sources. And what you find is you find that Herschel Atlas does detect very high redshift sources. In fact, we've detected sources out to a redshift of six. I don't think you can see it on the slide, but uh, this just shows a uh, redshift versus, um, just shows the redshifts of a lot of the sources. We find sources out to a redshift of six, but to be detected in the Herschel Atlas at 500 microns, these have to be incredibly luminous things, forming stars at thousands of solar masses a year. Now, so Herschel essentially gave us the ability to see dust in the universe and dust and shrouded star formation in the universe fairly easily out to a redshift of one to two. And then the more extreme luminous systems out at very high redshifts. Uh, but Muscat and Toltec are going to change the game here because they are going to be, with them, it's going to be possible to cover very large areas of sky, but out to much higher redshifts. Um, and I know Muscat observations are already planned to cover H Atlas, uh, but with Toltec, which also has the 1.4 millimeter and 2 millimeter uh, wavelengths in principle, you could go even further and do, do even greater. So I think the, the power of these big surveys with Toltec and, Toltec and Muscat is going to be in combination with um, surveys carried out um, at um, other wavelengths. Uh, now, these are, I mean, these are really kind of obvious things, which I'm sure everyone knows anyway, but I thought I'd just like to say them. Um, now, another thing that is, um, you probably won't be aware of so much, um, is one of the things that everyone likes to find at the moment are high redshift protoclusters. High redshift protoclusters are important for lots of different reasons. They're, they're the key to answering many questions about galaxy evolution. Um, one question in particular, which I'm interested in, is trying to understand a, a fundamental observation of galaxies that's actually been around for almost 100 years. So if you look back to, I think it's paper in 1931 by Hubble and um, Holman, they noticed that when they looked in clusters of galaxies, the galaxies tended to be mostly what we call early type galaxies, the ellipticals and S0s. And that density morphology relationship has been around for a long time. And there are two possible explanations, at least in a hand-waving way. One possibility is there are environmental processes operating in clusters that somehow turn galaxies from spiral galaxies into things like ellipticals and S0s. Uh, we know there's lots of hot gas in clusters, and that can strip the gas out of clusters and out of galaxies. And so it's possible to think of um, um, environmental processes. Um, so often these are called nurture processes. I mean, we talk about nature and nurture, and the environmental processes would be nurture. Uh, but the other possibility is that galaxies and clusters tend to have been formed at an earlier time. So it is possible there were just processes operating in the early universe uh, that caused galaxies then just to have bigger stellar bulges. You can sort of say those are nature rather than nurture. So there's, as in many parts of human life, there's a kind of uh, argument between nature and nurture. Now, protoclusters are probably the key to this, because in a protocluster, you have galaxies, and a, a group of galaxies that is going to collapse to form a cluster, but has not yet quite done it. So there's no hot gas there. So a lot of the environmental processes aren't working. So if you find a high redshift protocluster, and you see the galaxies are already quite evolved, that would suggest that it's nature rather than nurture. Anyway, um, so with Herschel, in the Herschel Atlas, we carried out this huge survey of the sky. So you might think we could find lots of these protoclusters. Um, now, in fact, we've only found two. The first one was found uh, several years ago when um, ALMA was used to observe a single Herschel Atlas source 
uh, that we knew was at a high redshift because of its estimated redshift. When Alma pointed at this, this um, source, um, it found there were actually 10 individual sources within the Herschel source. Uh, and that, that's, that's a really interesting uh, protocluster, and it was published in a paper by Ivan Otio et al. in 2018. But that was a single source. And at some point, a couple of years ago, <coughs> what I, I, I went through the whole Herschel Atlas um, catalog, which is almost half a million sources, estimated redshifts for every source, then tried to find clusters of sources at the same redshift. And the only one that I came up with is the one shown in the image at the right, it's a cluster of sources that you detect at 500 microns, but are hardly there at 250 microns. So I estimated the redshifts of these five sources as being about four. So there was a potential proto-cluster there, the redshifts of four. Um, and then I put in a proposal to use ALMA to do a spectral line survey of this region. And what, we, what I found is that if you look on the left-hand side, that's our, our ALMA redshifts. And you can see there's a big spike in the redshifts at a redshift of 3.6. There's about 10 sources there. So it appears to be a proto-cluster at a redshift of 3.6. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, but we, can find, we found about two of these proto, high redshift proto-clusters containing lots of dust obscured star formation. Uh, but with um, scuba three, not scuba, scuba two is too small to do, do a big survey for proto-clusters. But what you need to do is do a sensitive survey over um, hundreds of square degrees. Um, and with the new camera on the JCMT and also Muscat and Toltec, it will be possible to do this kind of thing. So I think this is, this is the kind of science that LMT um, and also JCMT and Scuba3 will do really well. So um, I'm going to stop at that point. So thank you very much for listening. And, uh, you know, Matt and, and, and me in Cardiff, we're really interested in collaborating on all kinds of projects um, with uh, members of the uh, Mexican community because uh, you guys have got the biggest millimetre telescope in the world, uh, which is going to be an incredibly powerful thing. So anyway, thank you for listening. Okay, thanks, uh, Steve. Um, so uh, we, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, if anyone uh, can raise their, click on the raise hand button, I can, I can take your question. Or, or, or I can start with I can start with a question. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very interested in your uh, results for the uh, with the illustrious TNG simulation. So I, I was wondering if this is already published or or at least on the archive. Uh, sorry if I missed. Uh, no, no, it's first. it's just about to be. It's 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 it, um, it's been resubmitted. There's just a very few cha small changes, so we expect it to be accepted uh, very quickly. Um, so it will be on the archive in the next week or so, I think. Okay. Um, I, I should say one thing is that illustrious TNG seems to be particularly bad at um, doing this. So there are there is a paper um, from the Eagle or based on Eagle simulations that that does better at predicting the dust in the high redshift universe, but illustrious TNG doesn't do it very well at all. Is is the, is the Eagle paper the one by Peter Camps by chance? Or? Um, I can't. There's there's one by um, um, Romy, Rom, uh, Romeo Dabbe, um which looks. No, oh, hang on, that's not true. I'm not, so I I can't remember. No, okay, okay. Uh, and also one one uh, related question uh, about this. Uh, well, it's a bit of a technical detail, but uh, very important. Yeah. The, the the dust to metals ratio. Uh, did you assume that half of the metals are are dust? Um, so that's that's slightly higher than, than, than other values I've seen used in simulations. Like for example, well actually the Eagle, Eagle team, they, they, um, they favor uh, uh, 0.3, so 30% of the, yeah, the yeah. metals is in, and you know, they, they compare with um, mid-infrared uh, observations. So I was wondering if you could uh, maybe uh, um, you know, say, say a bit more about uh, why 50% why, uh, uh, of, of, of the metals. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. So, so um, you're right. Uh, different people assume different things. So, um, by 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 assuming 0.5, we're kind of get, getting the maximum amount of dust anyway. So, so in a way, if we put yeah, 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 no, it, it won't help if you use. <laughs> well, it won't help. Um, so, the what we the the values you observationally the values mostly come or the um, I think the ones that are trustworthy come from 
depletion measurements where you you look at the um, you look at some object and you try and work out the abundances of the heavy elements in the interstellar medium and then if you if you then assume you've got say solar metallicities you can work out what mass of metals should be in the dust now if you look at um, massive galaxies uh, if you look in the Milky Way or big galaxies um, in the nearby universe, you often do come up with a number about 0.5. Now, for galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds, you actually get much, much lower values. So, so the fraction of metals in, in dwarf galaxies seems to be much lower. Um, but we weren't really worried about that anyway, because all the galaxies in our stacking analysis are quite big galaxies. Um, when you come to look at um, evolution, you, you start looking at things like damp Lyman alpha absorption systems and gamma ray bursters, all kinds of things. And again, the evidence seems to be that the high metallicity, high mass things seem to have a lot of the metals bound up in dust. And, I mean, number I normally use is 0.5, but it could be 0.3. But when you go to the low metallicity systems, it's much, much less than that. Um, which is kind of it. That, that's actually interesting for other reasons. but. Um, uh, but then if you want to explain the evolution, you have to assume that somehow the dust, the fraction of metals incorporated in the dust changes with redshift. Um, and we're already at the maximum value of, pretty much the maximum value of 0.5, so. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so, Jacopo, uh, do you have a question? Yes, if you could please go back to the slide where you were showing uh, uh, the relation between beta and it was, uh, I don't remember what, with, with all the model failing, basically. Oh, oh yeah, okay, got it. So, it's, uh, you had one model that was uh, on, the rela on the observed relation, if I... Y yes, okay, that. that's right. So, um, ah, <laughs> I can't... Yeah. So, none of the models um, predict the... Um, the inverse correlation between R and beta. Um, all the models at the, in, at the top here get the absolute value of R completely wrong. And I think, I think, I think some of these are, at least one of those is, is Bruce Drain's model. One of the model gets the absolute value reasonably right. And I can't remember what it is, um, but you can check it up. If you go to the uh, Whitworth et al 2019, um, I've taken the figure from there. So unfortunately, I can't remember which model does get it right. And, and uh, okay, so um, this hasn't been done as far as you know for, for dust in, in the Milky Way. Uh, the, oh, okay, so there is, that's interesting. Um, yes, so, well, not quite. Um, so, I think people have worked out, use Planck data, there is a paper, Planck paper, where they, use, they basically measure R, um, I think, and they find that the R value in the Milky Way is also, I think, a factor of three different than the predictions of, the, the, you know, the drain at our models that existed at that time. So, the standard, I mean, you know, Bruce Drain is the, is the god of dust and his models don't actually do a very good job at explaining the values of R. I believe um, that there's a new set of Drain models uh, that have all been introduced to try and explain the polarization properties of dust. I think they do better at getting the, getting the values of R right. But the other thing to notice is there's, there's two things none of the models do right at all. Uh, they don't get this inverse correlation and uh, the models don't actually predict the high values of beta that you actually see in the universe so you can see here in this picture that beta there's lots of values of beta that are way higher than two um, but none of the nobody's models produce this so that's another there's some fundamental problems in explaining the properties of dust but is, isn't beta related uh, to the grain size distribution as well uh, I, I'm not aware 
that you can change. I'm not aware that changing the grain size distribution will Modified. change meter, but I might be wrong. My, my, my knowledge of interstellar dust models is a little bit not that great. So I'd be happy to be shown to be wrong, and there is some simple way of explaining the high values of beta. Okay. But I, every time I meet every time I meet a dust person, I ask them this question. I haven't got a straight answer so far. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So I see that uh, Eric Martinez uh, do, uh, has a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about the, the parameter that you show, the global parameter for the galaxy. You have tried to see if this parameter varies with the global time. So I'm having, I have difficulty. I think there's some interference on the line. I'm having difficulty. Yeah, or, or maybe too much echo, maybe. Um, if you, I mean, you could write it, you could write it in. Uh, if if, I, if if there's some problem, you can just write it in chat, I guess. Um, uh, maybe you can put the question in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a good idea. I can I can I can read your question in the chat. Okay, so oh, it's a beta pi. That's interesting. Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, so the question is: Is the beta parameter varying with Hubble type? Uh, so let me just show the screen again. Um, where's it gone to? Um, um, well, yes, it, well, it, I don't, no one's really checked to see that. Um, but what beta does seem to vary, it does seem to increase with um, stellar mass. Uh, so as you go to higher stellar masses, you will be going to earlier Hubble types. And also, if you look on the um, this picture here, you see that beta is increasing with uh, stellar density. So again, I think it seems to be the galaxies it, it's the massive galaxies with dense centers that seem to have the highest value of beta. I don't know why this is. I know I, I, and I, if anyone has any good suggestions as to some of the explanations, some physical chemical explanation of why these things are happening, that would be great. Because we spent almost 10 years with these results, not, not this particular result and don't really understand it. Okay, um, are there any other questions? Or Well, um, well, actually, ju just a quick one. So, if we um, so going back to the uh, comparison with uh, with uh, illustrious CNG. Um, okay. Um, well, I mean, of course, uh, these these simulations, uh, these uh, cosmological simulations. I mean, they don't include uh, dust explicitly, right? So, which That's is why we, we we use the cold gas as a tracer for for dust. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, in fact, I, I might be a bit guilty of uh, uh, promoting this idea that, that it's, a, it's a good idea to use the cold gas. Uh, but I mean, it's better than, it's the best thing we, we can do, uh, given, the, given the simulations. Um, however, uh, so, so, but the, I think the main problem is that uh, there might not be enough resolution, right? Uh, um, it could be a resolution. Uh, so the amount of cold gas, I think, depends on, depends on resolution. So. 
Um, so basically, my point is that I think I think all, all of the all of the cosmological simulations, uh, illustrious CMG, Eagle, uh, Horizon, Engine, I think they, they should do about uh, uh, equally bad. I think uh, for the uh, uh, when modeling those those properties, I think. Um, so in a way, I'm, I'm very I'm very uh, keen on uh, looking forward to to seeing this uh, this draft uh, uh, soon. Yeah. Oh, good. Good, good. Yeah. I'm sorry if I can interrupt there. Oh, yes, because I, I, I think I lost uh, the thing with the uh, illustris and with eagle. What is the main difference then in your initial conditions that you get? Uh, I mean, the amount of cold gas different, also different. So what is the difference? Well, no, that's that's what I'm curious about. I mean, both, both simulations have uh, similar resolution. The same, right? And the same. Uh, I think they, they even. I mean, the not same. the resolution. I, I'm talking more about the the recipe. I mean, the initial condition more than the resolution. Is it yeah, the well, same? I think maybe maybe we can maybe we can leave this uh, discussion for for later. I, I could also uh, talk okay. for for a while about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. About this. Well, just just but, there's yeah. a paper there's, there's a paper by um, Dave et al. I think this year, where they they compare the different simulations and they look at the um, the gas content, and so they, they, the, the different simulations do seem to differ quite a lot in the amount of cold gas they have at high redshifts. And I think, I believe, um, the differences are partly to do with different feedback recipes. I'm yeah, sure. okay. I was wondering more in the sense that um, I guess you're you. I mean, you were comparing with a uh, illustrious TNG. 300 or which one? 100, I think. 100. So I was wondering if, uh, I mean, TNG 50 would be something that you can use because they change also the but recipes, right? Yeah, but that one is not public yet. So, <laughs> so uh, okay, eventually, eventually. But it, it will be interesting to, to compare the, to do like a resolution study with, with uh, eventually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. Um, uh, so I would like to uh, th thank the speaker uh, once again. Mm -hmm. uh,